Hi, welcome to A Grey Barn Rising. I'm sitting here this evening, as always, with Bootsy Beagle, and I'm drinking a cup of uh, wonderful uh, white tea, white peony tea by Mudan, which is a, a, a beautiful tea grown in Nepal. I'm reading the poems of the marvelous American poet Jean Frumpkin. This is a very special tribute that I'm doing this evening because I'm, I'm reading the poems this evening. It's January 29th. This would have been Jean's 87th birthday. Jean was born in 1928 and he left the body in 2007. He was born in the Bronx and uh, when he was young his family moved to Los Angeles in part for Jean's asthma. And Jean became part of a growing and dynamic poetry scene in L.A. Uh, many poets who gathered around uh, the uh, well-known uh, poet Thomas McGrath. Jean was part of uh, that circle. Um, they met at McGrath's house uh, on Marsh Street. He was part of uh, the group that came to be known as the Marsh Street Irregulars. And uh, he associated with poets like William Pillen and Burton Myers, Mel Weisberg. Uh, I'm also thinking of uh, Alvaro Cardona Hein, uh, who's another friend of mine uh, as well. And um, Alvaro was associated with that group. Gene was a dear friend of mine, and I'm, I'm so honored to uh, have met him, to have known him, and to have come to know his work so intimately. He moved to New Mexico in the 60s, I believe it was 1964, and he taught at the University of New Mexico for uh, a good long time until his retirement. So his poems are, um, they, they traverse many boundaries, but uh, many of them are located in the Southwest as well. So I'd like to begin with a, a very favorite Gene Frumpkin poem of mine from a little known book of his entitled, the, the book is called The Rainbow Walker, and this is the title poem. The Rainbow Walker. My father, the cold man in the darkness of the earth, is a blue flame that keeps my hands alive. I am heir to his station on the walrus rock from which one sees the earth as if it ended many years ago. Yet my life also erupts from his monument in bravura and heresy, a grave-seated joy growing. The theme is therefore revolt, revolt conspicuous as the silence of the ocean, hidden as the naked woman who holds the ocean in her arms at her breasts, a banner of blue jays in the wilderness, revolt, revolt, Revolt against the corruptible franchise of the blood, which takes nourishment from scorpions, from stone and leather, which is the hostile humming in the air, a saber-toothed Odysseus in the cosmos of love. My father, I sing you my discontent, who am due on the flower of reason, and mathematically an orchard. It is your lonely going through the black doorway with the weariness of your eyes in their last cloud and all the poor bread of your 70 years swimming about you that teaches me the devil. The sweetness of slitting the wrist of the sun and seeing the yellow blood howl down upon the ocean. Revolt, the peaceful man's brother rainbow across the waters of the dead. But I walk so slowly, my comradely image resembling my father smiles up at me saying, walk faster, walk on circus foot. Let your fist be olives and your eyes gazelles. Let your eyes be hammers. When your toes touch the secret arc of the rainbow circle, all the colors are yours. It's a powerful, leaping poem uh, demonstrating Gene went through many phases of his writing and incorporated uh, many influences and in schools of poetry, and certainly there's a lot of surrealism in, in that particular poem. 
I'd like to, to turn now to a very early chapbook, Dostoevsky and Other Nature Poems, and one of my very favorite titles for a book. The, the, the title reads almost as if Dostoevsky himself is a nature poem, or was a nature poem. Uh, this is, uh, these poems are also reprinted in the La Alameda book, uh, The Old Man Who Swam who swam Away and Left Only His Wet Feet. But uh, as is my um, practice, I'd like to read from the very early editions of books if I possibly can. So I'm going to uh, read a couple poems from here. This is Albuquerque's spleen. I mentioned um, his um, residence in the uh, Southwest. He's also playing off of uh, Baudelaire's uh, book, Paris Spleen. On warm nights in late June, at 2 a.m., on warm nights, as you lead the full Albuquerque moon by a leash, the future leaks into your shoes. Your feet are wet, the streets warm and dry. There is the moon, not the white moon of idols, which resembles a frigid bride, but your own moon with its sound of a single cymbal brash against the warm air. You have read Baudelaire and agree that time doesn't fly, but is a slow flea and mistress earth's perfect ambush. So you flee, your feet are drunk, tomorrow is already today. You tip the moon, it's a wobbling saucer, it barks at you, at your feet, so porous, the wine, the rising, warming legs and thighs. You believe on those warm nights. This elixir is the future and that it doesn't exist. It's all in your feet. All you're doing is going. Dostoevsky. When the river shines, those nights of green, translucent bones, the bearded man fishes for stars. He groans in this labor, which takes all his strength. What is hidden beneath the waters? A substance of moths. The stars slip away steadfastly. No hook of light so pure it can hold fast to the steady flow. The man's eyes, ecstatic beams, fasten onto the golden mean of transmutation. To still the slippery bones, it is the tongue he must use. No other weapon burns with such energy. Sweating, he sips the river. Green smoke tears into his eyes. Night after night he fishes for stars, his tongue a coal, a small orange curve among the gleaming green darts that resist in darkness and still resist until at last and then again he catches one. It is a secret he cannot part from who spent his life learning it, the bones of the river are his stars. They are ashes in his brain. He is the icon, the cauldron to whom we kneel in our bones. Beloved Isaiah, beloved original of sin, who knows how to stab himself to the heart with his baited crozier. I think I'll give you one more from Dostoevsky and other nature poems. The Nature of My Sexual Problem. Gene had a delightful sense of humor, too, uh, particularly in some of his, the titles of his poems. There was always such a sweetness and gentleness to his person and his, his manner, uh, and that certainly comes through in his poems. Not only do they have great uh, discursive power, 
great power of language, but they also have the power of tremendous humanity, the, tr the tremendous humanity that uh, he lived his life with and that he exhibited. The nature of my sexual problem. When you are a member of my body, the breath itself, mountains, you are my face, rivers, my blood, earth, my skin, sun, you are my eyes. Without the thunder, I cannot hear. Without a doorknob, there is nothing to touch. The savor of rainbows is in my mouth. There is nothing outside of me that is not within me. I travel day after day across the world to open one woman's eyelids. When she sees me, I see myself, then dream myself to sleep again, back in my hovel. Always the feathers of some woman's love, drifting, drifting through the sky, which is my heart. I see myself continually reaching for one blue feather, to kiss it forever, the sky so huge. My heart so small. Let me give you a couple more poems. I'd like to turn now to um, a book of his entitled Saturn is Mostly Weather. This is called At Such Times. At such times, it takes almost nothing. A sound on the map, a short ado moving down along the balustrade, something less than a slide frame of anything. Seen in sepia, she reminded me of love, like long ago, like someone who laughed and vanished in lavender. At such times, art punishes the Victrola plays leftover Schubert, but she wouldn't say love, would she, unless she meant it. And why not believe in such good luck? Why not at such times? Imagine it. But she is too young, too blonde, too obsessed. When torments the hyacinth, some lover placed honestly on her windowsill, in Carolina, where her mother sings German camp songs, and she herself goes mad every summer. Because she is a history stamped on whitest mind, I have entered the age of lust for the princess and eat with my fingers. I hack at palm fronds with my machete to mutilate all tropical manners. At such times, after she has smiled once more into the molding sun, I weep with unspecified pain. And I'd like to close uh, this evening's tribute to Jean Frumpkin by reading a poem that has not yet appeared in a, a book of his and, and should and hopefully one day will. He has a, a series of poems uh, based on uh, paintings. And this is a poem that he sent me uh, in manuscript that I simply adore. It's for our mutual friend Alvaro Cardona Hine, who besides being a marvelous poet in his own right uh, and a musician, is also an incredible painter. And this is about a painting that Gene had hanging in his uh, bedroom above his bed, in a, a painting that Alvaro painted. And it's entitled, Indian with his back to the night, which is also the title of the painting, title of the poem and title of the painting. Gene's poems are memorable for, also, for the ways that they also go into the past and, and transform that, uncover uh, elements of his past for uh, psychological and emotional rejuvenation, and I think some of that certainly happens in this poem. 
Indian with his back to the night for Alvaro Cardona Hine. One red hand twists into its memory, stained in passion solved. Work, a root in the ground as the sun settles into its night trap world and still works as if by charter signed. This man whose other hand is amber holds a hoe, retraces ancestors along a rail of furrows. I, who am editing my life, drink mango juice to compose me as I go into terror. When my father died, I was taken by a virus to an island I was barely aware of, ate white watermelons until the seeds rusted in my esophagus. I burrowed back into my mother's heart where a beggar Indian took my coins. A one-horned bird stood on night's perch inside the drizzle that slept in its myth. I am certain that my eyes were barely aware of what they saw in the dimly lit mortuary where my life drew in a slow tide in which all the music I'd ever heard silenced me through all my body and compass. The face that looks at me now lacks a version of delight. Its tight-lipped mouth expects no favors. Earth, where my truth lies, buried will parch the throat of its measure. I first read the Indian in one of my big little books, fat, square volumes, I eventually used as boxing gloves, pounding one against another that I now recognize as an athletic fit to drive my asthma into the ropes. Once my family took me to a farm in upstate New York, where the air they thought would be cleaner. I picked wild strawberries, smelled the weeds, and sneezed like small firecrackers. That night, a whole dimension of insects tried their luck against the skylight. The moon ignited them. At least I thought they were burning, dazzled by the stealth of my fever. My childhood generic Indian was exotic in a future I didn't think I would reach. I know now that Indians carry pitchforks, hoes, shovels, and work at life without holding a bow, armed with a clutch of arrows at the hip. If they beg, it is because my heart does not work hard enough. I save my, settle, my settling sons to exit again from this whisper that speaks to me. I am older now than my tailor father. I sight his needle through the Indian's talismanic thread. The bird flies for home, its one horn plowing the sky. <laughs> That's just such a beautiful poem of genes uh, in which he moves into the painting and moves into his memory and into his life. So this uh, reading this evening of A Gray Barn Rising was in tribute to the incredible American poet Gene Frumpkin. I read an unpublished poem uh, of his, um, Indian with his back to the night, and I also read from Saturn is Mostly Weather, Dostoevsky and other nature poems, and the Rainbow Walker. Thank you so much for joining Bootsy and me for another episode of A Grey Barn Rising.